Shalom, dear brothers and sisters. It is a, a very special um, privilege for me to be invited to this conference. And I'm here as the representative of uh, the Peace and Reconciliation Network of the World Evangelical Alliance, which I lead uh, since 2016. I'm very glad to be here and greetings from our people uh, all around the world. Uh, our network was, uh, was founded in 2016, uh, right after a UN conference on peace and reconciliation in uh, Istanbul, Turkey. At this conference, um, the uh, politicians from all around the world, they, uh, they uh, agreed that world religions, faith communities around the world, they are not only a source of uh, conflict and strife in the world, but also a possible wonderful source for reconciliation and resolving of conflicts. So we were invited to participate in a UN um, work towards peace and reconciliation in the world, and our network was established. Uh, I'm very uh, thankful for the, the years uh, be behind me for having been able to shape and uh, transform a network which works in many countries of the world it's very successfully. Thank you very much for inviting me to come here and speak at this conference. You see, we understand that peace is a major, probably the central part of the Gospel. Peace is what God brings in Jesus Christ to the world. He is our peace, we read in uh, Ephesians. And uh, Jesus himself has sent us to go to the world and do mission the way he himself was sent uh, to the world. And he was sent as uh, uh, God's ambassador to reconcile the world with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And in accordance with Jesus, we promote peace. We promote reconciliation among humans and God, their creator. We promote uh, reconciliation between men and women and their neighbors, and also between themselves. And even humans with creation because all creation longs for revelation of the children of God says Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 19 to 21 we are here in Europe and of course the big question is are we Europeans uh, in conflict do we need reconciliation is our continent free of conflict do we live in peace and uh, live in a state of peace? Why in the world to talk? Why in a, in the world to talk about reconciliation? Now let me start with a little example I just experienced in Belarus, in the uh, a European country, East uh, European country, with a lot of conflict. It's a divided country, politically divided country, in the city of Brest just near the Polish border, <coughs> I was invited to visit a graveyard of uh, about 1,200 Jews uh, killed by the German Nazis uh, during the World War II. And I was deeply ashamed. This graveyard was just recently discovered. Nobody knew they were killed there. And now we were staying at this place and I literally lost my voice. I'm a German myself. It is Germans like me who have been killing Jews massively, children, men and women. And facing this grave, I, uh, I uh, kept silent for days. And only after I apologized, I literally apologized, uh, apologized for what my fellow Germans did, um, well, a couple of decades back asked for forgiveness, I regained my voice because I came to Belarusia to address local issues, their questions of today, their pressing questions. How can I talk about issues of importance today if 
I am not reconciled or my people are not reconciled with the locals. I need, I need a voice and the voice comes back with forgiveness. No question, the situation in Belarusia is not much different from many, many places in Europe. We in Europe need reconciliation. East and West, North and South, our great continent has witnessed numerous wars and conflicts. Europeans carry enough historical baggage to be mad at each other for another century. The English, the French, the Spanish, the Russians, the Germans and other European nations have all built their empires, ruling over the smaller tribes and forcing them to adapt their culture and language accordingly. Just ask a Scot what she or he may think about the English. Or go to the, to the Catalonians, <coughs> ask them about Spanish. Or just uh, go to Ukrainians and ask them what they think about the Russians. It is always the same story. Most of our European empires have collapsed long since, but the hard feelings against former ruling nations stay. Collective memory, my dear brothers and sisters, goes ways back and shapes the attitude towards the, the other even where there is no obvious conflict today. Just consider the Baltics. I myself grew up in Estonia. Just consider the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. We will have a, uh, a talk about the situation in Latvia in a moment later. And uh, Vitaly Petrenko, Dr. Vitaly Petrenko, Petrenko will talk to us about the situation in Latvia. For centuries, those countries were occupied by the Russian Empire, later by the Soviet Union. Many Russian-speaking people from all corners of the former empire moved in and made the Baltics their new home. The Russification of the nationals by the Russian state was a programmatic, uh, programmatic pr uh, idea since the Tsar Alexander III, 1845 to 1894, introduced it. Consequently, national cultural values were suppressed and those the Russian language, Russianness, and the Russians became the most hated neighbors. The story was and is repeated in many European settings. With cultural dominance, conflicts became a constant reality in society, uh, a society lives by. And friends, the same is also true for churches. It is not just a state or community. It is not just the biggest society. Ethnocentrism and ethno-confessionalism are the biggest hindrances for preaching the gospel in Europe today. Unity, unity is uh, an asset. Unity promotes the knowledge of the Lord in the world, says Jesus in John chapter 17. 21. This unity in the country is the reason uh, why people do not see God's glory in his followers. Through the centuries of European conflicts, major church denominations were considering themselves as national, even state churches. In this way, they supported the empirical doctrine suppressing the smaller ethnic groups. No wonder those ethnic groups sought a different religious identity. You can see it among the 185 language and ethnic groups of the former Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. They became Muslim, they became Buddhist, they became whatever they became, but they didn't want to stay Christian because the Christian Orthodox Church was viewed as a major suppressing agent of the state. Denominational divides in, of Europe also go back to the empirical attempts to establish dominance of the one and only national identity. Unity forced by the state and the expense of freedom of others will always result 
in a culture of strife and hatred. Of course, the question is, what does this all have to do with the Church of Christ, with us evangelicals, with us evangelicals? We have probably not created yet a uh, colonial empire, have we? And personally, we may not have been involved in all kinds of, uh, of killing and hurting and so on. The other day, I visited the U.S. And in conversation with American evangelicals, I mentioned the fact that American nation has killed about six million Indians. And a prominent evangelical turned around to me and said, I didn't kill anybody. I have never killed anybody. It is not my business. Is it really not your business? What about the Church of Christ being responsible for issues of our time? The Church of Christ being ecclesia, the cold out of the world entity with a clear responsibility to transform the world. The Church of Christ is God's agent of reconciliation, that's for sure, because that's what Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 19 to 20. She can never be an appendage of the state. Her um, task is to promote the kingdom of God and not the kingdoms of a certain national majority. And in the kingdom of God, there will be never any concentration on ethnic backgrounds. Apostle Paul states it very clearly to the Galatians. I quote, In Christ there is neither a Jew nor a Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter, chapter 3 verse 28. And Jesus is our peace. And he made those from far, afar, and those near, one. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, 14. Ethnoconfessionalism is, biblically speaking, brothers and sisters, a no-go. Absolute no-go. The church is set to reconcile and not to divide and promote the politically strongest. It's not our business to promote the politically strongest but rather to stand at the side of those who need our comfort. By having said this, we of course place the European Evangelical Church into a special position. In the midst of a conflict and ethnocentric divisions, the Church will seek for ways to reconcile the people with God and with one another and lead them into God's kingdom. Stanley Hauerwas, a prominent theologian, summarizes the references to peace and mission in the New Testament by claiming that Jesus' followers are no less than, I quote, signs of the kingdom of peace in the world. Signs of God's kingdom of peace in the world. How can this be done? What are the instruments of effective reconciliation? How do people who have been collecting hatred for centuries forgive each other and establish new and meaningful pattern of cooperation? What do the scriptures say about all of this? Let us look, let us look into the scripture and discover God's way of reconciliation. Well, it is clear, Jesus Christ is God's radical reconciler. He came to reconcile the world with God, the Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 5.18 And he states the principles of radical reconciliation. Let me mention three. First, Jesus claims that people need to recognize the truth in order to be free. John chapter 8, 32. Recognition of truth is, uh, as, is a process by which people will overcome their prejudice. By looking at what has really happened, they may also discover their own limited perspectives 
towards other people that is often distorted by a collectively shaped memory. Our memory cheats us. And if collective memory cheats, it becomes a culture. It becomes a way of life. In re uh, reconciliation, the two parties will do what, um, what uh, the biblical term katalasso uh, in the New Testament suggests. Katalasso, reconciliation suggests they will go back and forth naming and renaming the issues of hurt and injustice until a common understanding of what has happened is established and the parties agree on it. Without knowing the story, brothers and sisters, no reconciliation is possible. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free, says Jesus. The European Evangelical Church as such, as God's reconciler, will mediate the process of truth-finding as a first step towards a peaceful coexistence in Europe. We will not repeat historical views of those who want to reshape history towards their own understanding. We look for things how they really happen. I will name those who have been victims and those who have been perpetrators. Secondly, where there is truth known and agreed upon, where victims and perpetrators are named and injustice is noticed, the mediator will suggest a process of forgiveness. The church will suggest a process of forgiveness. It is important not to compare injustices there is never a bigger or lesser sin. All injustice must be named and people asked for forgiveness. And perpetuation must be named, as Bishop Tutu, the South African Bishop Tutu, rightly claims for his own situation, South African situation. Well, I know collective and historic injustice is not a personal thing. As the mentioned Americans may say, we didn't kill anybody. Sure, we didn't. But people involved in the process may not have been directly involved in what in that hurting and perpetuation, but they remember together. They remember together. Victims have identified with the sufferings of their people, accepted the collective hurt, and lived accordingly. Now they are anyway eligible eligible to forgive perpetuated successors the same way as this uh, are eligible to ask them for forgiveness surely this is not an easy step this is a step of humility and grace in both humility and grace are god given in jesus there is freedom for both, humility and grace, for he is our peace. He establishes peace amongst us and in us. In us. Both requesting forgiveness and receiving forgiveness is a divine act. Because wherever the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. John chapter 8, 36. Confession and forgiveness belong together. When, wherever this act involves the presence of Jesus Christ himself, we will see forgiveness possible. And the negative memory will be, uh, will be put aside. Will be transformed into a valuable experience we all can learn from. And we need that experience. A European memory of forgiving and forgiveness. Reconciliation, however, is not finished when rivals forgive each other. There is a third step involved, and that st third step is equally important. The competitors will have to develop a common future, discussing possibilities and opportunities to work for better life conditions in their communities. Good life is what they expect to happen after they forgive each other after they reconciled with one another. Good life in their countries, in their countries and even beyond.
their own countries. We Europeans need an idea of what can be done together and what our positive relationships may look like. And Christians, evangelical Christians like us, Christians like us, are perfectly prepared to draw principles and practices from the Kingdom of God culture, which establishes a meaningful social space of living in unity by appreciating our diversity. As a matter of fact, the Church herself is called Body of Christ. And nothing, nothing is more diverse than a body, a human body. All parts are different, but at the same time, they all serve each other, and those establish the most powerful unity under the sun, especially where it where it uh, uh, talks about the church. Read, for instance, Ephesians chapter 123. So the church must teach the nations those principles. This is her divine calling. She is a missionary agent of God, sent to preach reconciliation. Reconciliation, by its very nature, is a new paradigm of God's mission for evangelicals around the world today. And of course, it is our dream, it is our dream with Peace and Reconciliation Network in the World Evangelical Alliance to see peace and reconciliation expressions established in all European countries. I really hope that evangelical, national evangelical alliances in European countries go that way. It is amazing how much could be done where such a network is established. For instance, in Ukraine. Since the Peace and Reconciliation Ukraine Network was established years back, they have become a major agent of reconciliation in their own country. They are today one of the few voices of Christians appreciated and valued on both sides of the front line in eastern Ukraine, offering trauma therapy and spiritual as well as psychological assistance to people, people uh, hurt by the war and working for a peaceful future. Similar stories I could tell you from many other countries. For instance, in the Balkans, in Hungary, in Russia, or even here in my own country, in Germany. Our network has developed a curriculum for a church development program which puts the church in the center of, uh, uh, of a community development, in the center as a church uh, of reconciliation, a center of reconciliation and mediation. Uh, our curriculum helps the churches to reorient themselves towards such a program and rediscover peace and reconciliation as their major task. Well, we gladly share our information with you. Feel free to ask us. Our latest uh, center of reconciliation was established in Yerevan, in uh, Armenia, a country uh, for many years in a very difficult um, relationship to the neighboring country of Azerbaijan and Turkey. Now the Peace and Reconciliation Center helps to set the agenda for churches to become uh, centers of reconciliation, carrying the message of peace, carrying the gospel, and the center of the gospel is reconciliation. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for listening to me. Hi, my name is Vitaly Petrenko. I'm Ukrainian by birth, but for the last 50 years I live and I'm associated with Latvia, where I reside in Riga, capital of Latvia. Within this given time, I want to share something which is on my heart, which I treasure and it's very dear to my heart. It is the theme of peace and reconciliation. For those of you who are not so familiar with Latvia, it's a small country and here you can see our flag, national flag of Latvia. Uh, Latvia is sandwiched 
between uh, Finland in the north, Estonia, um, Lithuania, and Poland in the south. And as you can see, Latvia is in the middle. To the west is the Baltic Sea, and then Sweden across the sea, and to the east, there's Russia and Belarus. Before we go into Latvian context, I want us to have a, a bit of a bigger picture and context. And of course, we need to mention the age of colonialism, uh, Western colonialism, be it uh, British, French, Spanish, Dutch, or Portuguese. And as we know from history, the age of colonialism started from 15th century onwards, when European powers, they started uh, making uh, discoveries and invaded, occupied, and then, of course, exploited different countries across the world. And more or less immediately, we come across different cases of interracial, interethnic uh, conflicts or subjugation of local indigenous people and nations by European colonial powers. And this theme, if you like, it runs throughout the ages and was relevant to each century. And of course, we come across the problem of superior attitude and subjugation of indigenous people by colonial powers. And here we would love you to look into a historical case study in Latvia and a Latvian nation. Uh, when we look into medieval times, of course, we need to mention uh, Northern Crusades. These were crusades undertaken by German, Teutonic, and Danish knights conquering Baltic lands, and obviously a Latvian nation coming into subjugation by uh, German knights. And here we can mention the process of Germanization of Latvian local population via uh, culture, uh, via language, for example, introducing uh, German letters into a, a Latvian alphabet. We also come across the cases of mistreatment of Latvian peasants by German landowners. For example, looking into history of Latvian nation, I came across cases when Latvian peasants, for example, but were not allowed even to enter the city of Riga, which was dominated by German dwellers. And there, whenever uh, Latvian uh, literary sources appear or indicate to us, there is a criticism which is directed against uh, German landowners, but in some cases also against German Lutheran pastors. And uh, of course, there are, as I mentioned, cases of exploitation and subjugation. And so this period, medieval and uh, domination by Germans with Swedes, lasts from 12th, 13th century until 18th century when Russian Empire comes into the scene and uh, there is a war between Russia and Sweden. And as a result of this northern war in 18th century, Latvia is incorporated, invaded, or occupied, if you like this sort of language, by Russian Empire and becomes the part of the Russian Empire. And here we can come across a different process which can be defined as a process of russifications of Latvians via education, language, and religion. As I mentioned, uh, Russia is our eastern uh, neighbor. And of course, religiously speaking, Russian Orthodoxy was making uh, inroads into Latvian lands. And there were some cases of uh, a Russian uh, Orthodox faith uh, present with their understanding of Christianity and imposition upon Latvian population. And of course, especially towards the end of the 19th century, 
we see a clear policy of Russification. Uh, before that, one cannot say that it was a systematic, but one can more qualify it as a more sporadic summer tense. But at the same time, uh, from the 19th century, we see also a subjugation of Latvian peasants by German landowners. And within uh, mid 19th century onwards, we witness the rise of Latvian uh, self-consciousness for the movement of Latvian nationalists and then another movement, Mlada Latishi or Young Latvians. We're starting to express a Latvian identity and culture and self-consciousness and also aspirations and dreams of Latvian society. And there we can come across very interesting, I can qualify it as a two-directional rhetoric and description of antagonism. One is directed against a German domination and yet at the same time some aspirations on the part of some Latvian intelligentsia which can be qualified as pro-Russian. For example, uh, Christian Valdemars, one of the well-known uh, Latvian uh, representatives of this movement, he clearly states that Latvian future is with the Russia. Uh, and so we can also talk here about mistreatment, if you like, of different nations within the Russian Empire. We should stress and emphasize that Latvians were not the only nation which was mistreated. Uh, there were cases of mistreatment of Caucasian people, but also uh, probably the harshest restrictions uh, were imposed upon Jews. Uh, if you are a student of the Russian Empire of this historical period, you'll come across such term as a pale of settlement, which meant basically the line drawn on the map, if you like, beyond which a Jewish settlers a nation could not move into uh, part of a European Russia. And so they were defined um, or restricted for settlement within certain areas. There were also restrictions upon different professions. And of course, we have to mention the cases of anti-Semitism against Jews towards the end of the 19th century. Here is a picture of one of the castles in Latvia. If you would love to come to Latvia, you are more than welcome. But history moves on. And obviously, here comes 20th eventful uh, century, which is full of different cataclysms. Uh, in relation to Latvian history, we need to highlight a very significant period for Latvia when in 1918, in the aftermath of the First World War, Latvia got a chance to declare its independence and Latvia becoming an independent state. Albeit for a short period of time between 1918 to 1939, where we witness uh, the signing of a secret pact between Nazi Germany and Soviet Union in 1939, and then happens invasion by Soviet troops of Latvia on June 17, 1940, and then starts another period or Soviet period of Latvia until 1991. And so if we're talking about the most recent history of Latvia in the aftermath of a collapse and breakup of the Soviet Union, here is a very interesting period when Latvia got a second chance to become independent state and republic. Uh, there were some fateful decisions taken by the Latvian government. One of them is to deprive a big chunk of Russian-speaking population from the citizenship. And so the Latvian society after 1991 became divided into citizens and non-citizens. And I have to mention the fact that people of different uh, nationalities or Russian-speaking people as we are known here in this part of the world came for different reasons to Latvia. Some of them, they came to work in the factories, others came because of uh, religious persecutions and restrictions imposed upon Christians in other republics. It was my family's history of coming to Latvia. And so 
A statistic says in 2021, 209 and seven people are stateless people. Basically, they are deprived of Latvian citizenship. And looking into the statistic and reading about the reasons as to why these Russian-speaking people, uh, they do not apply for Latvian citizenship, there are various reasons. And some of them, the historical hurts because people think that they should have been given citizenship just because they lived for a long time in Latvia. So statistic is an interesting thing, and it says that two-thirds of these stateless people are Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainians. 37% uh, of Latvian population, uh, for them, Russian language is native, and yet we're living in the country where the official status of Russian language is defined as a foreign language. And uh, different policies were resulted in a sad reality of Latvia with the appearance of two distinctive uh, societies, if you like, of diasporas. One of them, obviously, it's a Latvian nation. The other one, uh, society consisting of Russian-speaking people, which is made up of different nationalities. There were different attempts uh, to bring peace and reconciliation in our recent history throughout the even last 15 years, but they were met with a stiff resistance and condemnation by the larger part of the society. And I have to say that our country is crying out for peace and reconciliation in our generation. So some conclusions, if I may draw some conclusions. The conflicts and subjugations of one nation by the other isn't unique to a particular nation. One can say that it was systemic or systematic, which was, as we witnessed, was expressed throughout different ages in different contexts and on different continents. And the only solution or resolution of the status quo of existence, of coexistence only can be found through or in dialogue and peace and reconciliation initiatives. As we witness this sort of thing happening in South Africa, in Rwanda, where a peace and reconciliation initiative brought some healing and some reconciliation. And I believe that Latvia, together with other European nations, is crying out for peace and reconciliation. For me, as a Christian, as a pastor, as a historian, is important. The Word of God, or the initiative, if you like, or a commandment, which is expressed by Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when he talks about the Word and the ministry of reconciliation. This is a challenge for me and for all of us. The question is whether we will respond to this challenge. The question is whether we will be wise enough to rise up up to this challenge and to act upon it and to make wise decisions. May the Lord bless us, our generation, here in Latvia and in Europe, to do just that. Thank you for your attention.